like it is eight o'clock and so we will go ahead and get started. My name is Olivia. I'm a fourth year medical student at the University of Iowa Carver College of Medicine. I'm currently um, applying to the match in anesthesiology. So wish me luck. Match day is about six day, six weeks away. So we're wrapping up interview season and um, fourth year of med school is super great. So you'll have that to look forward to. Um, but today we're going to be talking about an ophthalmology topic. We're going to be talking about retinal detachment, which is one of the um, ophthalmologic emergencies that I think like everybody who's going to go into medicine definitely should know um, because regardless of like what kind of patients you work with, um, you'll want to know when to call the eye doctors and get their expertise to help and preserve people's vision um, if they're at risk for losing it. So super important topic. Um, and also I've uh, had a couple of requests for ophthalmology, I think, because people are interested in it as a specialty. So we'll kind of go through some uh, information about ophthalmology at the end of the talk as well. But as yeah, as a disclaimer, I'm not going to become an ophthalmologist, but um, I have rotated with them and I have a few friends who think it's pretty cool. So if this is your first time here, welcome. Um, we have a lot of fun. I think that these are great learning opportunities and great ways to get exposure to medical topics as a pre-med and especially during COVID when it can be hard to get shadowing in different specialties. Um, so we always start with going through a patient case and our patient will have like a history and physical. Um, we'll go through their physical exam um, and a differential diagnosis for what might be the possible causes of their problem. Um, and then we talk about the assessment and plan for that patient. And that kind of takes the first half of the virtual rounds. And then the second half is focused on the pathology of the disease. So we'll talk in more depth about the anatomy of the eye, um, what happens during retinal detachment, um, and why that happens. So please feel free to participate. Um, I do ask that people just like when we're going through the information are muted, but if you ever have a question or if I have questions for you, uh, feel free to either unmute or you can put any messages in the chat and I will have that window open um, to hopefully be able to see and, and respond to it as they're coming in. So whatever you feel comfortable with, but it is definitely more fun when people are active and participating and uh, able to contribute. Um, and please, again, don't hesitate if you have questions. Um, if you need to go back and catch some information that you might have missed, um, the soap note and quiz link is in the chat. So if you have any issues with accessing that, let me know. I can resend it for you. It's totally optional. It's just a way to kind of keep track of the case. And then the quiz at the end is for a certificate of completion. Um, and I'm super relaxed with the quiz. So like even at the end of the case, if you guys are working on it and want to go back to some slides, then I can show you the slides as you're working on that. So just let me know. So I'll give us a chance to open that up. And in the meantime, I will also have us mark where we are tuning in from. So I always, it takes me a second to turn on the annotation. Um, but I am currently in Eastern Iowa, in Iowa City. I'll just take a couple seconds for you guys to pull up your soap note and quiz and you can mark on the map where you are tuning in from as well. Well, a couple of people in New York, a few of us Midwesterners. Uh, sorry to interrupt. I just had a quick question. Yeah, what's up? It's actually my first time uh, doing one of these sessions. So yeah, how exactly do I, um, you know, use use a soap note? Yeah. So um, the, so the soap note link is in the chat, and so it's just a Google form. Um, if you can't access it or if it's not there for you, let me know. I can put the the link in again. Um, but basically, it's gonna have you just fill out some fields in the. Uh, Google form. And um, it's just a way for you to kind of follow along with the case. So the SOAP, the acronym SOAP stands for Subjective Objective Assessment and Plan. Um, and so I'll kind of guide you as we go through the case, like when we're going to switch sections, but the subjective portion of the note will be kind of like 
what does the patient tell us they're here for today? What are the problems that they're reporting? Um, and the other information in their history that would be relevant for us to know. Um, then the objective par portion would be like the physical exam, their vitals, anything that we can measure directly um, and have like a way to quantify or standardized like evaluation for. Um, and then the assessment and plan is the last part. And they're sometimes kind of lumped together, but it's just what do we think is going on with the patient? Like what's our diagnosis? Why do we think that's the diagnosis? And then the plan is what we're going to do to like treat them for it. So that's what SOAP stands for. And that's what is included in it. Um, and you just kind of work your way through that Google form. Again, if you have questions along the way, we can slow down or we can go back uh, if you miss any information. But again, it's more so just to kind of help you follow along. It's not graded or anything and it's not required at all. So Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thanks. That actually helps a lot. Um, yeah. And how, how do I uh, like put my location on the, on the map? And then, yeah, so this is, um, I actually have never done it like on a participant end. Um, on my end of things, like if I go to um, options, there's like a little, um, I can stamp a shape on there. It's uh -oh. in under like annotation. So it's just kind of for us to all see where everybody's tuning in from. And I always get an appreciation for people who are on the coasts because we're on different time zones and um, it kind of just, you know, makes you feel like you're a little bit more connected to the people on this call. So. Okay, I think I figured it out. Cool. Yeah. We've got a nice, nice spread today. Great. I hope everyone's experiencing nice weather where they are. We're currently getting snow in Iowa, which is fine. I actually like winter, but the roads were kind of bad today. So hopefully they're better tomorrow. Um, I'm going to clear all of the annotations so that they're not on the future slides. And we will get started with our case. All right. So we are going to be seeing a 60-year-old male who presents to the eye clinic as a same-day patient. So we called in like in the morning. And he has this chief complaint of right-sided vision loss. And so after calling the clinic, we schedule him to come in same day to get evaluated for his vision loss. And just to kind of show you guys like what he's describing, um, I found this picture online and the right or the left-sided image is what um, would be like normal. Um, and this is maybe what he's seeing out of his left eye. And then the right side um, is going to have this sort of pattern to it. So we're seeing like a darkness in the um, left upper corner on this right side, as well as a couple of these sort of like black streaky uh, floaty looking things. Um, so that's just uh, another representation of the vision loss that he's, ex that he's experiencing. Um, but we haven't like actually talked to him yet about what, what what the type of vision loss is. So again, just just so that you have a little bit of an idea of what it might look like if you were to go through what he's going through. So this is going to be where we um, put this in the subjective or the S portion of the note. So this is all self-reported from the patient, um, just kind of his story of what happened. So he's describing the vision loss as something like a shade that's coming down over the side of his eye. Um, and this onset suddenly about two hours ago. So again, like the temporality of when his symptoms occurred, like did they start gradually over weeks or days um, or did this come on like super quick in just a matter of seconds or minutes? Um, what was going on around the time that they started? He didn't have any preceding symptoms. So like no eye pain, no headache, um, no foreign body um, that he can identify like he wasn't doing any sort of um, woodworking or construction or having flying objects around. So that's all important information, pertinent negative information in formulating what might've happened. So in addition to the shade coming down over the side of his eye, he also is saying that he sees a lot of new floaters and floaters are like black specks or dark colored specks that are kind of in your vision that um, if you move your eyes from like side to side or up and down, they just kind of like slowly um, will follow that pattern of your eye movements. Um, and they also tend to appear more um, 
apparently when you're looking at something that's bright and with a with a plain background. Um, so these new floaters for him are something that's also just started in the last two hours with the shade. Um, and then the other associated symptom is that he's having flashes of light in the periphery of this right eye, of the affected eye. So we have a, like three different things going on. We have the shade coming down over the side of the eye. We have the new floaters and we have the flashes of light in the periphery of his vision. And then for negative symptoms, he does not have any eye pain. He does not have any headache. He doesn't think that there's any sort of foreign body. Um, he's not tearing or a lot or like producing tears. And there's also no um, like itchiness or other discomfort of the eye. Um, so this is, again, some um, some subjective information for the SOAP note, um, because this is self-reported by the patient. Um, we include past medical history, family history, and social history as um, kind of the additional history that's not really related to the chief complaint that they're having, but that can give us a better understanding of their overall health. So for his past medical history, um, he has a diagnosis of hypertension. Hypertension is the medical term for high blood pressure. So he's taking a, a medicine called lisinopril for his high blood pressure. And this is a super, super common blood pressure medicine that people are on to help um, lower their blood pressure. Um, and his only surgeries or procedures that he's, he's ever had is a vasectomy um, that he had at age 44. So this was decades ago. Um, and does anybody know what a vasectomy is that they can share? Or like what the purpose of a vasectomy is? Oh. Yeah, that's the procedure to cut the vas deferens in order to cut off sperm production. Perfect. Yes. Awesome. So it's a form of kind of permanent birth control for men um, so that you don't have sperm um, sperm cells that can be passed through um, in the semen and, and to hopefully prevent pregnancy um, without having the woman have to do any birth control. So just another like medical terminology. I like to kind of like tie other things into this, even though it's not super relevant. Um, so for family history, um, we also look at that, especially if it's related to the um, the chief complaint the patient's presenting with. So um, sometimes our history is very focused, and in eye clinic especially, they might just ask about family history of eye diseases and not really pay so much attention to like, oh, your mom has diabetes, or I guess that might be relevant, but like um, your mom broke her leg when when she was a kid or something like that. It's not as relevant for this particular workup. So for um, family eye history, um, his mother did have or does have cataracts. Does anybody know what cataracts are? It's kind of like a lens kind of built up over your eye. Yeah, absolutely. So we all have a lens in our eye that um, is important for focusing the light onto the retina. And um, cataracts are when the lens becomes clouded and um, you sort of get this like clouding or fogging appearance um, to the eye over time. And the, the biggest thing for this is age. It's actually quite common in people who are of older age. Um, and luckily cataracts are treatable with surgery. They can go in and actually take out the lens of, of your eye and replace it with a new lens that um, isn't going to have that cloudiness and that um, that discoloration to it. So it's pretty common. Um, it The treatment, again, does require surgery. So um, we don't have the information of if she's actually received the surgery, but it's just another, it's, it's good to know the um, eye diagnosis. And then um, his uh, sister also has had LASIK or laser eye surgery for severe myopia. And myopia is the medical term for nearsightedness. So there's either myopia, which is nearsightedness, and that's where you have um, your close-up vision is okay, but your far away vision is blurry. So that's the more, I would say, common one, especially in younger people, um, that they have trouble with far, like their distance vision and that they would wear a prescription for their distance versus hyperopia, which is uh, farsightedness. And that's where you would need like reading glasses or something to help you see things closer up. So that's the difference between those. Um, and again, laser eye surgery is pretty common. People with um, farsighted or with nearsightedness um, specifically to correct their distance vision um, can, can be candidates for laser eye surgery sometimes. 
And then lastly, his social history. Um, he worked in IT for his career and is now retired. And he enjoys going to the park with his grandkids. So I think it's always important to get to know your patients and, and the things that um, make them who they are and not just their medical problems or what they're seeing you for today and start to, um, these, these can be ways to build and continue a good relationship with them and to show interest in their lives outside of their medical problems. Okay. So moving into our differential diagnosis, this doesn't have to go in your note at all. This is just for your own knowledge and information. Um, a differential diagnosis is where we kind of think about all the different things that could cause the, um, could be the cause of why the patient is, is having these symptoms. Um, and I'm specifically focusing on what vision emergencies are, like uh, the, the ophthalmologic emergencies that we want to make sure um, we rule out in somebody who's presenting with vision loss so that they don't have permanent vision loss um, if it goes untreated. So uh, the first one that I wanted to talk about is something called a retinal artery occlusion. Um, the retina, just like any other tissue to the body, um, requires a blood supply. And so arteries will supply blood to the, to the tissue and, and to the retina here. Um, and so if you occlude it, or if you have something obstructing the artery, then um, you cut off the blood supply to that part of the body or to, to the retina here. Um, and something that, um, it's a little bit more like med school, like advanced, I guess, but it's it's called amaurosis fugax. And this is a, a transient. So it's a, a self-resolving and like very quick, usually only about 10 minutes that it can happen um, where you get that classic shade coming down over the eye. And that's due to um, typically an embolism of cholesterol plaque that um, travels from the carotid artery in the neck. Um, your arteries kind of branch into like a tree and into smaller and smaller, smaller little arteries. Um, and eventually a plaque can get dislodged um, from a bigger artery and get trapped in a smaller artery, like the one to the retina. Um, and that will essentially um, disrupt the function of whatever tissue it's supplying. So that part of the retina that's fed by the retinal artery that's that's cut off its blood supply um, would then not really be able to perceive light and be able to perceive um, whatever you're trying to look at. Um, but again, the key here is that this is transient. So it's going to go away um, pretty quickly and it doesn't require any treatment. But um, retinal artery occlusions, if they don't go away, um, you know, they they can be have permanent effects. And so it's important to, um, you know, seek treatment and seek medical attention quickly if you notice this type of a change in your vision um, so that you can get proper treatment for it. So retinal artery occlusion is the first one. The second one is something called the giant cell arteritis. Um, I don't want you guys to like worry too much about the mechanism of this, but it's essentially, um, it's an autoimmune disease that causes inflammation of the temporal artery. So again, the, tem the temple here, like where you would associate the temporal bone or the temple of your head. Um, and there's an artery that kind of goes across it. And sometimes you can even feel the pulsation on yourself. And when you get inflammation of that artery, um, again, you can sometimes have um, irreversible blindness if you don't treat it in time. So it's something to keep on your differential, to keep a broad differential and not rule out anything until you know that that's not the cause, that you have reason to believe that this is for sure not what's causing it. Um, and this is just another one of those things that um, should be on the list for vision loss. The third one here is retinal detachment. Um, as you could probably imagine from the title of this, it's probably what this patient is experiencing, but um, that's where the back of the eye, the photoreceptor cells that make up the, the retina, which is the light receiving and light receptive part of the eye that feeds into the optic nerve. Um, if that separates from the eye and isn't able to um, process the light and the images that are hitting it, then you can have, again, irreversible blindness if it's not treated in time. Closed angle glaucoma or angle closure glaucoma, they kind of are interchangeable, but glaucoma, there's two different types. And the, the one that's more scary and the one that we um, want to be really careful with is um, angle closure, the closed angle one. Um, and I, I won't get into the mechanism for this, but I just wanted you guys to know that this is one of the ophthalmologic emergencies 
um, that we would want to include on the differential diagnosis. And essentially, just to give you an overview of glaucoma, it's where the pressure inside of your eye is really high. And so you can get compression of the optic nerve. Um, and so that's why we um, we want to make sure that the optic nerve stays healthy and that it's not being compressed. And so um, for this, we would want to make sure that the pressure of the eye is corrected. And then the last one here is an open globe injury, um, which is most commonly going to be a penetrating eye trauma. Um, although sometimes it can be like really corrosive chemical burns as well. But um, the penetrating eye trauma here is, is super important. Like obviously if you get struck in the eye with like a shard of glass or a pencil or something um, that actually goes through your eye can, can be one, a really big infection risk, two, it disrupts the tissues that are, um, are, are really sensitive to, to um, distortion and things like that. And so um, if you have any of these things, especially this open globe injury, um, it's time to call the ophthalmologist and let them kind of take over and make sure that they're doing everything that they need to do to work up and treat this patient. Okay, so moving into the physical exam. So this is gonna be in the objective portion of the note now that we're done with the subjective. So we always start with vitals here. Um, I have the vitals reported up here. The patient's blood pressure is 122 over 82. The heart rate is 74 beats per minute. The respiratory rate is um, 14 breaths per minute. The temperature is 37 degrees Celsius and the um, oxygen saturation is 100%. Does anybody want to try to interpret these vitals and see which ones are normal? Are there any that are abnormal? Any guesses? It's okay if you don't know. Dan is guessing that the respiratory rate's low. I would I would say that it's it's probably normal. Like if you'd actually be surprised that if you actually counted the number of times that you breathe in a minute, it's it's actually lower than you would expect. Um, although I do really appreciate you um trying to to offer um your interpretation here. Um Bridget's saying heart rate normal. I agree. Really across the board, all of these vitals are very normal and reassuring. Um the the cutoff loosely for blood pressure, uh, for normal blood pressure in an adult um, that we'd like to see would be less than 120 over 80, but they, this is so borderline and so close to the normal range that I would just call all of these normal. And despite him even having a diagnosis of high blood pressure, his medication is obviously working because it's not exceedingly high. So um, yeah, these look pretty good for his vitals. Um, and then the rest of the exam here, I really just have it focused on the eyes. I didn't include like cardiovascular, pulmonary, abdominal, all of that sort of stuff that we typically include in our physical exam. Um, again, like it, it's really dependent on the specialty. If you go to the eye doctor, I almost guarantee they're never going to listen to your heart <laughs> with their stethoscope. Like they're just going to be looking at your eyes um, and they break it up into your left and your right eye. So everything is done separately. And um, the left eye is often abbreviated. OS um, and right eyes abbreviated OD. I don't remember exactly what they stand for, but if you ever um, like go to the eye doctor and like look at your note afterwards, then you'll probably see OS and OD instead of left and right, just so that you guys know that, what that means. So um, these are um, kind of just the most important like overall categories of an eye exam. Again, it will kind of depend on what the patient problem is. Like they might just do a focused fundoscopic exam if you have known retina disease and they're not going to really do much with the rest of these things. But for a general eye exam, we always start with visual acuity. And this is where the patient is going to, um, you know, cover up one eye at a time and they are going to look at that, that chart with like the letters on it or the numbers or whatever, the shapes, if it's a kid and they don't, they can't read yet. And this will tell you what their visual acuity is and how clearly they can see things. So his um, left-sided acuity is 20, 20 over 30, um, and his right-sided acuity is 20 over 40. So that's actually pretty good, um, especially that he's having this loss of vision in the right side. 
this tells us that we're still able to, that he's still able to have acuity of the part that's intact. Um, and also I should mention that like for documenting this in the objective or in the, like in your SOAP note, um, you can include like as much or as little information as you want. Like if you just wanted to put the significance, I, I kind of highlighted them in red here, um, but don't feel like you have to make an entire table and like copy everything word for word um, because that's just excessive. <laughs> Unless you want to, it's totally your choice. Anyway, so visual acuity is the first thing that we look at. Um, we look at both far away and we look at close up. Um, and we do it one eye at a time. So like you're going to cover your, your right eye to assess the left acuity and vice versa. The next thing we're going to look at is the extraocular movements. This is going to be um, assessing for like if you're able to move your eye to the side, up, looking down, going back to the side, looking midline, going off to the side again, and, and just making sure that your eye movements are all um, full range of motion that you can look really like to the, the corners of your eyes and that your movements are congruent as well. So that if, you're, if your two eyes are looking in, in one direction, that they should be looking in the same direction and that one of them isn't looking off to the side and one of them is looking straight and not able to get to that side. So it's looking for both um, the range of motion and to make sure that they are congruent. The next thing is visual fields. So this is looking at your peripheral vision. So um, again, you're gonna be having the patient cover up one eye at a time. And um, usually we do to finger counting. So like if you have them just kind of focus on, on your nose or on something that's like in the center of their field of vision, and then you hold up like a couple of fingers, how many fingers am I holding up here? How many fingers am I holding up here? In the different quadrants of your vision so that you can assess the peripheral vision. And as you can see here um, on the right side, this patient has lost their superior nasal side. So in, in my right eye here, that would be like if I was covering this up, that I couldn't see really anything um, that's, that's more to the side of the midline on the side of the nose, if that makes sense. So it's, it's like if you were to close your eyes, um, the side closest to your nose, that they wouldn't be able to see anything kind of past midline. Um, and that's concerning again for that shade that's coming down that's affecting that area that they're just not getting any like light perceived there. Um, externally, we also like to observe the eye and see and examine um, if there's any abnormalities with the lids, the lashes, um, the conjunctiva and the sclera. So the lids are obviously your eyelids, your eyelashes as well. Um, and then your conjunctiva is kind of like the clear slimy layer on top of your eye. And the sclera is the like harder white of the eye that's underneath that kind of makes up the whole, um, the ball of the eye, so to speak. Um, and all of that looks clear, no redness, no swelling, no crusting. Next is the pupil exam. Um, we usually try to estimate the size of the pupils in millimeters. Um, sometimes you have like a little chart, like a, a cheat sheet that you can hold it next to the pupil and just estimate the size of them. Um, are they super, super dilated and like blown out or are they super, super pinpoint and really, really tiny? Um, so we're looking at the size of the pupils just in normal light. Um, what shape are they? Are they round? Are they teardrop shaped? Are they um, abnormal in any way? And then we're also going to assess the um, pupillary light reflex. And I have a video in the next slide showing that. So um, it's basically looking at when you shine a light into the pupil, will they constrict equally? Um, and so I'll wait to show you guys the video on the next slide and that will hopefully clear that up. And then the last part is the fundoscopic exam. So that's actually looking into the pupil through to the back of the eye and looking at the structures within the back of the eye. So that's things like the optic nerve, the retinal vasculature, like the retinal vein and the retinal artery, um, and then the retina itself too, like the actual, um, the, the layer of the eye that is sitting at the back and that the retinal cells are a part of. Um, does that look like smooth and flat or are there, are there um, like waves and distortion to it? Um, so again, here in the fundoscopic exam, we're seeing a detachment of the retina from the nine o'clock to the 12 o'clock position at the nasal border. So again, that's kind of consistent with the loss of their um, vision on the nasal side here, the shade that's coming over that they're reporting being like on that um, 
the left part of their right sided vision. Um, and then uh, on the fundoscopic exam, um, which I should mention, the fundus of the eye is just like the back of the eye so that everybody knows the terminology. The last thing I wanted to point out is that um, we're going to do almost all of this exam with the with the patient not being dilated yet. We don't want to dilate them for the fundoscopic exam, which it's necessary to like the pupils are small. It's really hard to shoot a light into the, the eye and be able to see the structures back there with such a small pupil. And if you're looking straight into a light, like your pupil is going to constrict because it's it's trying to protect you from getting too much light in your eye. Um, and so we dilate people um, to help open up their pupil and be able to see better into the back of their eye. But when you dilate them, you lose visual acuity. I'm sure we've all had dilated eye exams before, and it's really blurry after um, you get dilated and you can't really see anything. So it wouldn't make sense to measure visual acuity when you're dilated because it's going to be artificially wrong and it's going to be look worse than it actually is. And same with the pupillary um, like light reflex exam, that um, if you're dilated and you're shining a light into your eyes, you're not going to constrict your pupils as much um, as you otherwise would if you weren't dilated. So it's important to do your exam um, that needs to be done without dilation first, and then whatever needs to be done with dilation, you save to the end. So I just wanted to make a point of that. Um, next, I'm going to show you guys some videos of what these different... Um, exam maneuvers look like. So we'll look at the pupillary reflexes first. So I'm going to, I'm going to start that over here. Like you can kind of see, um, with this light shining in her eye, here's the pupil, this dark circle here. Um, and the iris is the colored part that surrounds the pupil. And as you shine the light in the eye, um, the pupil will shrink and the iris will constrict. And then when the light gets taken away, um, notice like after it shrinks here, it will dilate again. Like it's going to get bigger in, res in response to accommodating that, that light being taken away. Um, so it's kind of subtle. It's, it's a quick video like I, this part of the video I kind of isolated just to show you guys like what it looks like um and then you can also see like um they're going to shine the light in the other side and we want to see this pupil constrict in response to the other eye being uh having a light shown into it so um you'll see here like the the light just went shined into the other eye but we see the pupil on this eye constrict as well and that's important for having, again, that congruent and symmetric um, reflex between the two eyes that you want to, if one eye is doing one thing, you want the other eye to do the other, the same thing. So we'll, we'll watch that one more time to show you guys what it looks like. Shrinking there, it's going to dilate again, and then we shine it in the other side, and it's going to shrink, and then it'll dilate back up again as soon as you take the light away. So that's the pupillary reflex. And this is going to be the fundoscopic exam. Um, it's, I will, as a disclaimer, if you were to go to the eye doctor, they're going to use this machine here that's called a slit lamp. And it's a lot more controlled and it gives you a lot more detail than doing like where you hold the little eye scope up to somebody really close. Like it's really, really hard. And you'll get a wider and more stable view. Comment on how distinct the margin of the disc is, the color of the neuroretinal ring, and the cut. So this is showing again, like this is somebody holding an ophthalmoscope in their hand and they're shining the light and looking through the window to visualize the structures in the back of the eye. Um, and you can see it's kind of shaky. You can't really um, focus for a long period of time on um, the structures back there, but you are able to see the vasculature, like these are the blood vessels. Um, and then you can also sometimes um, usually make out the optic nerve and then um, the rest of the retina. Then look for other signs along four major branches of the retinal vessels. So as you can imagine, it's a little awkward, like being that close to somebody um, and like just shining a light in their eye and kind of breathing on them. And it's not even that um, accurate anyways, like if you are not used to using this tool frequently. So um, ophthalmologists, they all have these op um, slit lamps in their office and to have stabilization of the head the, of the head of the patient can really help um, with getting a, a more still and clear image. 
Um, and then they also just have a lot more tools and precision that they can do to look at the different parts of the eye. So um, in real life, like this is more commonly used. And this is, I would say the fundoscopic exam, like with the ophthalmoscope is more in like primary care settings, like a family medicine doctor or a pediatrician or something would use this versus a slit lamp. Um, so just to show that they're both looking at the same thing, like they're looking at the back of the eye, um, but that they're just different in the way that they're used. Finish by asking the patient to look into the light to bring the center of the macula, called the fovea, into view. In a non-dilated eye, this will cause the pupil to constrict and you will lose the... So yeah, that's kind of uh, to show you guys what the fundoscopic exam looks like. And I have some more pictures of what the back of the eye looks like um, that's not like in a video, so you can actually see the, the structures. So, um, here's what it should look like. Again, it's not, it's never this good. Um, but just to point out some anatomy here, again, we're looking at the back of the eye. So this is going to be like the retina and the structures of the fundus of the eye. Um, right away, you're kind of drawn to this circle here. This is the whole optic nerve. Um, and so this sort of like light, um, this, this light circle that has all of these um, like blood vessels kind of branching out of it. This is the optic nerve here. Um, and then you have the retinal artery and vein um, that are branching out of um, where the nerve exits uh, for the eye. Um, over here, what's circled is the fovea and the macula. And um, this is actually your central vision. So your optic nerve and where the, va the vessels are coming out is not your center of vision. This is off to the side of your vision, actually. Um, your fovea is the most sharp, crisp central vision that you have. And the macula is like the area surrounding it. So you have a really, really high density of the photoreceptor cells in this area. Um, and so it's a really, really sensitive area to vision changes and vision loss. Um, so those are a couple of structures just to point out for you guys. And this is um, in a patient who, like our patient, is experiencing a retinal detachment, you can see this sort of like wavy um, maze looking thing that's just kind of like being peeled off the back of the eye. And that's all the layer of the retina that's just being detached from the sclera and from the back of the eye. Um, and so if this is the fovea and the macula, we're not quite there yet where it's detached. And so they might have really good central vision, like their acuity might be okay. But their peripheral vision here, um, in that like in that superior part of the eye, um, is going to be basically non-existent. So it's really scary when it gets close to this center vision. All right, moving on finally to the assessment and plan. Um, this was kind of front loaded with the patient case, and the actual pathology part is going to be a little bit less. So. Um, Bear with me here, but this is the this is the last part. So, a 60 year old male um, presenting with sudden onset painless loss of vision in the nasal side of his right eye. This is just a summary of who he is and what he what he's experiencing. Um, this is associated with flashes of light and an increase in floaters. Again, kind of some supplementing information that's helping lead us towards a diagnosis. His exam was significant for. Decreased finger counting in the nasal field, visual field of the right eye, and signs of retinal detachment on fundoscopic exam. So this is kind of integrating the summary of the patient presentation, um, what their exam showed, and what we think is the um, diagnosis. So he has a retinal detachment. And the last part with the plan, um, his plan is going to be to go to the OR for surgery. And the point of this, I don't want to go through every single different surgical technique and because um, there's a couple different ones that you can do for a retinal detachment. The one that I, I wanted to um, list here in case anybody was curious and wanted to read about it, it's called a scleral buckle. And that's where the um, ophthalmologists in, in the operating room are able to take the eye and physically like put a um, like a band um, going down like into the back of the eye, like under the eyelid and pull the eye back towards the retina so that you're kind of sandwiching the retina back onto where it's supposed to be. And so you're physically like belting it in place. That's why it's called a buckle. Um, as you can imagine, like it's quite invasive. Um, it's, it's very uncomfortable for patients um, to have this and it's not a permanent implant. Um, eventually they will take out the buckle um, and after the retina has re reattached and 
um, is stable. Um, but that's one of the possible interventions that you can do. There's other ones, but I didn't want to overwhelm people with all the different like names of surgeries that you can do. So that's just one of the ones that I wanted to list. All right, so that's the end of the soap note um, portion of the soap note and quiz. So I'm going to keep going, but if there's anything that you guys want to go back to at the end, I'm happy to go back so that you can get any information that you need. Any questions about the patient case before we move on? Cool. If anything comes up, feel free to put it in the chat. So just to kind of run through the anatomy of the eye, um, I think like this is a really good simplistic picture of the entire eye as a whole. Um, like I mentioned before, we have the um, anterior components of the eye, like the lens. This is the, again, the thing that's affected in cataracts. Um, the lens is going to be what focuses the light that comes in through the eye onto the back of the retina. Um, the pupil is the opening to the eye um, and surrounded by the iris, that colored part. So this person would have a brown iris. Other people have, you know, blue or green or whatever color their, their eyes are that are actually going to affect the size of the pupil. Um, the conjunctiva is the overlying layer. It's not labeled here, but it's that sort of slimy mucus layer that's on top of the eye. And then the sclera is this entire like white, harder part that um, is like the whites of your eyes um, that goes all the way to the back. And that's what the retina is going to be adhered to. Um, and this box here is showing like if you were to zoom in on the retina, you've got your rod cells and your cone cells, which um, is kind of a blast from the past for me. Um, from like your uh, biology classes or psychology, or I'm not sure if like where you learned um, about rods and cones, but these are the photoreceptor cells of the retina that will eventually connect to the optic nerve and transmit the visual information to the brain. So super important job because they are the ones that are receiving and transmitting the light impulses into visual information. And then again, we kind of looked at a picture like this before, um, but at this, the back of where the retina is. So the retina is this whole sort of like grayish orangey um, background of, of, of the fundus here. And then we have like the optic disc and optic cup that are make up the optic nerve, the retinal vasculature that are branching off here. And then the macula and the fovea is just again, pointing out that your center of vision is off to the side of your of your optic nerve. And this is actually going to be a blind spot that everybody has. Um, there's like tricks that you can do online to find where your blind spot is. And it's kind of cool. Um, it's a little weird if you <laughs> haven't done it, but because to know that like everybody has a blind spot in their eye, but um, that this is where your center of vision is. So um, we look for this sort of like naturally darker spot that has a higher concentration of those rods and cones. Um, and that we want to make sure that like if if there's any retinal disease going on that we try to keep this as clear as we possibly can so the patient has crisp, clear center vision. Some pathology of um, retinal detachment. So this is something that commonly affects um, or most commonly is going to impact people who are over 50 years old. And it's not common actually, it's pretty rare. The incidence is approximately one in 10,000 annually in US and Europe, with US having slightly higher rates of retinal detachment, we don't really know why. Um, but still one in 10,000 people is like not super common, you know, um, but definitely age is one of the main risk factors. Other risk factors are if you have a personal history of retinal detachment, so like this patient that we just saw, he is now at risk for having another detachment either in the same eye or in the other eye at some point in his life. Um, same with having a first degree relative with retinal detachment. So now, um, like the rest of his family, his sister and his mother and his children or whatever, by having him have had a retinal detachment, they will be at higher risk for having retinal detachment as well. Um, if you have a history of eye surgery, so if you have cataract uh, surgery, if you have laser eye surgery, if you have any other type of eye surgery, um, it's an invasive procedure. It um, can put you at risk for having retinal detachment in, in the future. Um, and then other chronic eye diseases. This is a really big one. Like the eyes are an organ, just like any other part of the body, and they're susceptible to damage from systemic diseases. So things like diabetes, 
can affect the retina. This is called diabetic retinopathy. Um, and sometimes you can have really, really bad uncontrolled diabetic retinopathy that can lead to a retinal detachment. Um, and so all of those things can be risk, fa risk factors for retinal detachment. And um, I kind of alluded to this earlier, but your prognosis or the um, the uh, how good or bad your outcomes are going to be, um, your prognosis is worse when the macula or that area of your central vision um, is affected. So if your macula is um, untouched by the detachment and it's only the periphery, then um, that's a better prognosis and you'll still preserve your center vision. But if you have your macula kind of detach, then you are left with part of your peripheral vision, but it's a really like compared to if you were to leave the macula on, um, it's a much, a, a much worse prognosis. This is again, kind of showing the, uh, the structure of the retina. Um, you guys don't have to worry about um, the names of these different cells, but basically if, if this is like um, the back of the eye with light coming in, like if the front of the eye is towards the top of the screen, um, light would be coming in and coming through these cells, um, being uh, hitting off the pigment epithelium. Um, and then all of these cells are going to communicate the, the nerve impulse um, through to the next one. And then they will eventually join into the optic nerve and the optic nerve will travel to the brain, to the primary visual cortex to interpret that information. So you can kind of see the pattern of like how the light has to get all the way to the back of the eye to this pigment epithelium. And if it's detached, then it's, um, or if any of these layers become detached, then you're not able to transmit that information to the optic nerve to communicate it to the brain. And this is just another um, diagnostic modality called OCT. It stands for um, optical coherence tomography. And it's kind of um, taking an image of the back of the eye. So this is a, a normal retina here. It's a cross section of the retina where we see um, like the pigment epithelium is going to be down here at the bottom. Um, and then the, the optic nerve fibers are going to be running along the top here. Um, and this is a normal retina. Everything is nice and flat and smooth. Um, there's really no like bumps or weird abnormalities that are going on. Um, and then if you can uh, contrast it with the one below, um, you have this huge area underneath here um, where the retina tissue and cells have like completely come off the bottom of the eye um, again. So they're not going to be able to um, perceive that light that's coming in and transmit that visual information to the brain. And um, I should also point out that this little dip here in the middle, this is the macula. This is where that center of vision is. Um, and you can tell that that's the case because in this uh, cross section here, which is like the fundoscopic exam and you see like the optic disc and the vessels that are coming off here, remember off to the side is this macula and the fovea. So if this green line is going right through it, we know this is the macula and the fovea. And we're looking right here where this dip naturally would occur in the normal retina here. So this would be a macula off detachment. So this person has lost their central vision um, and they need to be treated immediately to try to get this to reattach so that they can have their central vision back. So this is definitely not a good um, prognosis. Um, but as a patient update, so I try to include these, they don't have to go in your note or anything, but just for some peace of mind. <laughs> Our patient did go to the OR for same day surgery to place the retina back onto the back of the eye. He went for that buccal surgery. Um, and while he's still recovering from the surgery and he's going to have some short-term vision disturbances, his prognosis is good because the macula was stayed attached thanks to our prompt evaluation and treatment of his condition. So again, takeaway of eye conditions and eye diseases is get prompt evaluation and treatment if you ever notice any sort of vision change, um, especially those red flag symptoms like the flashes of light, the shade coming down over the eye, having lots of new floaters that are kind of like going through your vision and stuff. Um, and that goes for you, for your family members, for your future patients. If you're like a um, an OBGYN and a patient comes in and is like, hey, I have this weird shade over my eye, like call the ophthalmology people and just have them come and look at this patient. All right, so that's pretty much the end of the case and the pathology. I know the pathology was really short and it was mostly just showing you guys some more pictures. 
Um, but I, yeah, it's really um, just to know kind of the risk factors for retinal detachment, what it can look like on the different imaging. Um, and that's really like all that I wanted you guys to be, to have to know and to worry about for this session. Ophthalmology is a very specialized field um, and it takes people not like, not even as like a medical student, I'm almost to the end of medical school. And ophthalmology is one of those things that like, even if I did a rotation, um, it takes years of additional training and practice to be able to do the exam maneuvers correctly, to use the ophthalmoscope or the slit lamp, um, and to be able to um, be able to identify and, and and understand these different things that go on in the eye, because it's just so specialized. So I didn't want to overwhelm you guys, but still just give you a little bit of exposure to the specialty and to this condition. But ophthalmology is a super cool field. Ophthalmology, um, you're literally giving people their sight back and you're helping keep their eyes healthy for their whole life. So you can work with kids, you can work with adults, you can work with really, really old elderly people who are like, have really bad vision and you can help to prolong and treat their vision. And, and that's such a vital and important part of living in our experience. Um, for so many people. And so people are are really grateful for the care that they get from ophthalmologists. And it can be a very rewarding job. Um, but they are specialists in the medical and surgical management of diseases of the eye. So they're pretty much um, you know, one organ, one organ specialist, they focus on the eye. They don't do too much with other parts of the body, although um, you know, it's important to have a strong foundation of medical knowledge because things like diabetes, like I mentioned, um, among many other things, can um, or that amaurosis fugax, where you have like a, a cholesterol plaque that gets thrown into the eye, um, cardiovascular diseases and diabetes and other chronic diseases um systemically can present with um eye manifestations. So um, it's, you know, they're, they're great doctors and they, they focus on the eye, but they have, um, great medical knowledge, uh, from other parts of the body as well. Their expertise ranges from primary care, um, and annual exams that you would go to, um, as a totally healthy person, even with like 20, 20 vision, totally normal to seeing and, and performing surgery on people who have really debilitating eye conditions. Um, and even things like retina surgery, which is really crazy. Um, so you can become very, very subspecialized in ophthalmology, or you can be more of a generalist and see a wide variety of things. And a beauty of ophthalmology that makes it so attractive to so many people is that you really get a variety um, of things that you can do. But overall, like the lifestyle is very good because a lot of it um, can be done in like a clinic or outpatient setting. Um, so you work kind of more like eight to five hours, um, see people during the, the work week and not on the weekends. Um, and then some days you might have OR days and you're able to do surgeries and do procedures and work with your hands and be um, doing those types of interventions for people who need it. Um, ophthalmologists, I would say like on the spectrum of medicine, they, they do take um, less call compared to other specialties, but they still have those really rewarding patient relationships that I was mentioning earlier. Oh, and also I forgot to mention, but um, I think pro most people probably have seen Dr. Glockham Flecken on social media. He's an ophthalmologist and he actually went to residency at the University of Iowa where I go to medical school. So we're very fond of him. And um, he does like comedy, medical, medical comedy skits on TikTok and, and other social media. So highly recommend checking him out. But anyways, to become an ophthalmologist, um, four years of medical school, which in the U.S. is going to be MD or DO. I know all of you guys are working towards going to medical school. So like you're going to do that. But then afterwards, you're going to do four years of residency. This is like a um, one intern year followed by like three ophthalmology specific years. And then there's a lot of opportunity for subspecialty fellowships. So you can focus on like pediatrics and strabismus, which is like a common pediatric eye disease, neuro ophthalmology. So things like um, neuro neurologic diseases that pre present with vision manifestations and how those two can intersect uh, retina and vitreous surgery. So that'd be like prime, like the case we just saw is like prime retina vitriol um, specialist. 
because that's like really their area of expertise. Oculoplastics, um, so like um, the eyelids, the surrounding tissue of the eye, and it's kind of combining um, aesthetics and plastic surgery and functionally helping people who have um, the tissue around the eye who are uh, impairing their vision or their, their eye health. Um, glaucoma, if that's like a disease that you're super interested in, you can really do so much um, for subspecialty, or you can stay a generalist and you can do more primary stuff with a, a wide variety of patients. I also wanted to mention the other eye providers um, that are work very closely with ophthalmologists, and that's optometrists. Optometrists um, are also going to get a four-year doctorate degree, and that's going to be an OD. It stands for, I think, uh, or it means doctor of optometry. It's funny because, um, like it's flipped DO it's, it's, so it's, it's not a physician in the sense that you went to medical school, um, and, uh, like are a doctor for, um, like medicine as a, as like, as it pertains to the entire body. Um, but, um, for a doctor of optometry, uh, this is kind of like the bread and butter. I, diseases and treatments um, is in your arsenal. So you provide a lot of primary care to patients and manage common eye diseases. You can write prescriptions for glasses and contacts and eye drops and medicines that people would have to take for their eye problems. And the, um, the main limitation here with optometrists is that they don't perform surgery. So if you had a patient as an optometrist who needed surgery, you would refer them to an ophthalmologist to um, kind of take over their care in that problem. Um, but like I personally, like I see an optometrist for my primary care and I actually, I, I have a retinal disease um, that I won't get into, but I see a retinal specialist who's an ophthalmologist in addition to that for just that problem. But I primarily just see an optometrist for like to get my glasses renewed every year. So that's a little bit about op ophthalmology and optometry. And hopefully that Gave you a little bit of an idea of what they do. And maybe if you're interested in it, you can try to find someone to shadow and get some more experience in, in that area. These are my sources from today. And um, yeah, so it's it's now uh, you guys are totally free to go. Um, if you have any um, issues with the soap note or the with the quiz at the end of the soap note, um, let me know or if there's any questions that you would like to go back to in the slides. I'm happy to go back and, and revisit some of the information that we saw uh, previously. But if not, then you're absolutely free to go. I hope that you all have a great rest of your week, that your semester and new year is off to a good start, and um, that we'll see you in another two weeks from now. But I'll just hang around. And if there's any questions, let me know. Awesome, Olivia. Thank you so much. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. No problem. Can I ask you, what is your um, specialty in med school? So I um, am applying to anesthesiology right now. So I'm sorry, um, anesthesiology. Oh, anesthesiology. Okay. Mm -hmm. What do you do during that? If I ask. Yeah. So um, currently, I'm I'm still an applicant. So um, we will. I, uh, submitted our applications in the fall. I've interviewed at a couple of residency programs, and then um, we'll find out in March where we go to residency. But anesthesiologists, um, I think obviously I'm biased. They have one of the coolest jobs in medicine, um, but they, they take care of people who are um, in surgery, who have to go to sleep for surgery and make sure that they stay safe um, and that their pain is well controlled and um, that they're basically just watching out for the patient when they're undergoing a surgical procedure and, and keeping them healthy during that time. Awesome. Well, mm -hmm. thanks for sharing, Olivia. Appreciate yeah. it. Thank you for coming. No problem. Enjoy your night.